Hello. I'm here to talk to you a little bit about our next topic in the ecology section. And this has to do with community ecology. And so previously we talked about populations, which were groups of individuals that were all in the same species. Now we're going to go up in complexity. Now we're going to have multiple populations interacting and different species interacting. And so these can, things can get very complicated, but also very fascinating. And so, again, this is um, you know just kind of a, a survey and overview. We're not going to get too deeply into this, but you know, I'm mostly going to show you a lot of really cool examples of, of different phenomena we see when we study community ecology. So let's get to it. Um, in this first part, we're going to talk about several different interspecific interactions. So interspecific interactions between different species. And then in, in later lectures, we're going to talk a little bit about community structure. And so as I mentioned, a community is a group of interacting populations. So now we have different species and how those different species interact and relate to one another. And so you can get very complex relationships, but again, very fascinating relationships. And so we can, qual uh, we can describe these different types of interspecific interactions. And we can do that based upon whether each species, uh, we look at the different species and we ask, you know, which one is helped, which one is harmed, or are there no effect on one of the species? And by looking at it in that manner, we can describe several different types of interactions, such as competition, predation, parasitism, mutualism, and commensalism. And so again, these are defined based upon whether each species, you know, each species is helped or harmed or not affected. And, and we base that based upon their fitness. So is their fitness improved by the relationship? Is their fitness harmed by the relationship? Or does the relationship have no effect on their fitness? And so we'll talk about each of these in a little bit more detail, but just to give you an example of what I'm talking about here, let's look at the first one, competition. And so you've got two different species that are competing for the same resource. In that relationship, we see that the fitness of both species is decreased because they both have to spend energy, you know, competing for the resource. If, if there was no relationship, they would have more of the resource and their fitness would go up. So both species have reduced fitness when they compete. And so that's how we define competition, when both species have reduced fitness. And so that's how we're going to try and define each of these types of relationships. So let's start with competition. And so we talked about this when we talked about natural selection, that um, you know organisms over-reproduce, uh, resources are finite, and so it's inevitable that organisms are going to compete for limited resources. And so if you've got two different species that are competing for the same resource, we call that inter-specific competition. Inter means between. So you think of the interstate roads go between different states. They're not stuck within one state. But you also can have intra specific competition. That's competition among individuals of the same species. And so usually you have both types of competition occurring at the same time. So for example, think of a squirrel living in a forest. Now this squirrel is competing with other squirrels for acorns, right? So that is intra-specific competition, competition within the species. But that squirrel also, there, there are other species that are also trying to get those acorns, like deer and mice, wood ducks, crows. These are other species who are also trying to get that acorn. 
and that squirrel's competing with those other species. That's inter-specific competition. And again, we define that as competition because the fitness of all of them is reduced. If there was no competition, they would have higher fitness. So everybody loses in competition. And so we've talked about competition quite a bit um, because it affects natural selection. But there's other types of interspecific relationships that also influence natural selection and are also important to evolution, not just competition. And so that's what some of these other relationships are that we're going to talk about now. So for example, predation. Predation is another interspecific relationship. And so predation is when one species, which is the predator, kills and eats the other species, which is the prey. And so here you've got a win-lose, right? The fitness of the predator goes up because they got something to eat. The fitness of the prey goes down because they got killed. And so whereas competition, both species had lower fitness, in predation, one species has higher fitness and one species has lower fitness. And as we said, this too is influenced by natural selection and influences natural selection. And so, uh, again, in this lecture, I, you know, I'm just kind of giving you the 10,000 foot view and I'm showing you some very interesting examples. And one ex interesting example that's a result of this, this type of interaction is the range of techniques that prey use to avoid being eaten by the predator. And so not only are organisms having to compete with other organisms and with their same species for resources, but a lot of organisms are also at the same time trying to avoid being eaten. Natural selection acts on all of this. And the end result is some pretty fascinating prey responses. And so that's what I'm going to show you now. Just some cool examples of prey responses. And so those prey, you know, they've got to figure out some way to defend themselves. And they got all kinds of ways. For example, chemical defenses, right? And so you've got the skunks here. The skunks produce a, a compound that has a very noxious smell. And so that is to ward off predators. And that's one way that these prey can protect themselves. Uh, this fish here, a lot of fish have what we call alarm pheromones. And so alarm pheromones are chemical signals between fish. And so it's, it's a way for fish to sense that there's a predator in the area. And so then they can hide and they can get away from that predator. Um, you've got the rattlesnake here. It's got venom. You know, venom can be used by both predator and prey, right? The snake acting as a predator is going to use that venom to immobilize its prey, you know, and make it easier to eat. But also, you've got venomous organisms that that's their defense against a predator. The predator knows that if I mess with this organism, I'm going to, you know, get sick or hurt or killed. So, chemical defenses are one interesting result of this predator-prey interaction. Another way that prey can protect themselves is by cryptic coloration, more commonly called camouflage, right? And so there's fascinating examples of prey that are well camouflaged, right? I mean, this frog is, is a pretty cool example, right? This frog hiding out on this lichen-covered rock is very well camouflaged. Walking sticks, uh, you know, the walking stick very much resembles a stick. It's got very good camouflage. Cryptic coloration. So what am I looking at here? Right, this is a picture I took in a, a parking lot, a rock parking lot. Well, you might notice that toward the center there, you've got some well camouflaged eggs. It's not just the organism itself, but, you know, it needs to camouflage uh, um, 
eggs and nests and things to protect them from being preyed upon. This is a kill deer nest. And so if you are ever around uh, limestone rock driveways or, or parking lots or whatever at the right time of year, you might see kill deers nesting. And they, they have evolved and their eggs are very well camouflaged for that type of background. Again, here's another really cool frog, right, with amazing cryptic coloration. But, you know, your eye kind of picks up, you, you can kind of see this frog. Obviously, I've primed you for that. You know, I've, you know, you're looking for it. But also, why? Why is it that you pretty quickly see that there's a frog here, right? Um, well, you know, we're predators, so we have that very acute um, visual sense and and so we've we're good at picking things out but immediately we see what we see that eye and that's always a problem for lots of prey is because you can't always hide that eye and anything with an eye is likely something that can be eaten right and so the predators are good at looking for eyes and another advantage for the predator to look for an eye is that's usually where the brain is right that's a that's a um, a vulnerable portion or vul a vulnerable part of the prey and so if that predator is good at seeing eyes the predator says hey there's something there that I can eat and that's a good place for me to attack so that's a trade-off that's something that prey have trouble with trying to hide that eye so you see responses to that and so here's a fish and you'll notice it's got this dark stripe and that dark stripe goes right through the eye and you see this in a lot of fish and other organisms too where if they've got a stripe that stripe almost all, often goes through the eye and it's just a, a way that has evolved to try to to hide that eye in this fish you also see something that we see a lot in, in lots of fish called counter shading where the, the top of the fish is dark and the bottom of the fish is light. And so again, you can think about it. If you're a predator and you're underneath a fish looking up, you're looking up at the sky, that's a light background. So the bottom of the fish has a light coloration to hide against that light background. But if you're a predator and you're on top of this fish and you're looking down, you're looking down to the bottom of the lake. That's a dark background. And so fish often have dark tops, dorsal surfaces, dark dorsal surfaces, to hide against that dark background when you're looking down. That's called counter shading. That's another type of camouflage. Um, here's a moth, and this moth is just sitting. It's not very much camouflaged, but it's got a unique coloration. If a predator came and attacked this moth, this is what would happen. It would immediately flash these wings that are underneath which have these big eye spots on them. Well, what's that going to do to a predator? The predator is coming at this prey, all of a sudden it sees what looks like big eyes, that's going to startle the predator, isn't it? That's the idea. And so that might give that moth that split second chance to escape. And so these eye spots are also an important aspect of prey coloration. Right? In this example, and so the eye spot is called an ocelli. And in this example, the ocelli are perhaps designed to startle a predator, to give the prey a chance to escape. Here's another example of an ocellus. So the singular is ocellus. This is a cool fish called a bowfin. We have these around here. And you notice on the tail, you've got that eye spot. And so that could be that could be for a lot of reasons. That could be just something that they use for mating. But um, it's likely that this ocellus and this bowfin is to draw a predator attack away from a vital portion of the body. You see that this eye spot is toward the tail. Again, a predator is going to evolve uh, this behavior where it attacks the eye because the eye is usually at the head and that's the spot you want to attack if you want to subdue your prey. So some prey have evolved eye spots at a less vulnerable part of their body, like the tail. And so if this draws the predator attack to the tail, that may give that prey just enough of an advantage 
to to slip away. So again, this is all, that's all I'm saying is is there's just so many cool examples of this kind of stuff out there in nature, and this is why I think ecology is such a fascinating field. Okay, other types of coloration that prey have evolved something called aposematic coloration and it's sort of the opposite of cryptic coloration this is warning coloration so in these type of prey you're not trying to hide selection has not selected for organisms that are doing a good job of hiding They've been selected for just the opposite. They are very, very obvious. And they are warning the predator to stay away. And so predators learn to avoid these, these prey that have aposematic coloration. So the skunk is an example, right? You've seen skunks. Skunks aren't trying to hide. They're trying to be very, very obvious because they have that chemical defense. And so they're, you know, the, they've been selected for the the predators to learn, hey, anything that looks like that, I'm staying away because it's got this noxious smell. And so you see it in things like poison dart frogs, right? Again, they produce this chemical, this venom, that if a predator attacks this prey, it's going to kill them or at least make them very sick. So it's to the prey's advantage to advertise, hey, I'm not tasty. And so that's why you see a lot of brightly colored organisms often have some sort of chemical or or other type of, of defense. Again, here's another frog. This frog is not trying to hide. This frog is trying to advertise, hey, don't eat me, you will get sick. Um, here's a coral snake. Um, the coral snake, very venomous snake. And so, again, a bird or something sees this very brightly colored snake is not going to attack it because it's a very dangerous organism. Uh, you wouldn't think the monarch butterfly is a very dangerous organism, right? But monarch butterflies are very brightly colored to advertise that they're not good to eat. The monarch butterfly feeds on milkweeds. And the milkweeds have compounds, have chemicals in them that get into the monarch butterfly that make the butterfly poisonous. And so, you know, birds and other predators that eat this butterfly are going to get sick. So the monarch butterfly is very brightly colored to advertise, hey, don't even bother eating me, right? Um, and this is why, you know, so the monarchs, where they're, they're um, potentially might be listed as endangered species. Their uh, numbers are dwindling. Uh, a lot of that has to do with the fact that they can't, that, that we don't have as many of these milkweeds anymore. And they have to have these milkweeds, and this is one reason why they have to have these milkweeds. So, planting milkweeds, that's something you should, uh, we're encouraging people to do more, is plant more milkweeds to try to help monarch butterflies. Anyway, now, you might think about this and you might see, well, wait a minute. Like, how does that predator know to avoid that prey? Like, it's one thing to understand that that prey has evolved these bright colors to advertise, hey, I'm, I'm inedible. But how does the predator know it's inedible, right? Well, you know, natural selection can select for predators that just are born with instincts to avoid that. But also, often, the predator needs to learn that. And so the, the, the predator learns, needs to learn that the prey is inedible. And so here's a, uh, this is a, a study that was done, and I just like this set of pictures. I just like to show this, right? So here you've got a young blue jay, right? And this blue jay is learning what it can eat and what it can't eat. And here it's caught a monarch butterfly, and it's eating this monarch butterfly, right? So to this young blue jay, hey, look, this is an easy prey. I'm, you know, uh, this is something yummy. And here's that same blue jay puking his guts out after he eats the monarch butterfly, right? So... This blue jay has probably learned, oh, anything that looks like that is going to give me a tummy ache. I'm going to avoid it, right? Now, you might say, that's great, but does that, that not, you know, that butterfly did get eaten. So that coloration didn't help that particular butterfly, and that's right. But that butterfly that got eaten has relatives that also have the same color. 
And so it's called kin selection. So although that butterfly that got eaten did have lower fitness and, and probably didn't reproduce as much and didn't survive well, now this bird has learned to avoid anything that looks like that butterfly. And so that butterfly that was killed, his relatives have a better chance of survival because now this, you know, this blue jay has learned not to eat it. So it's very fascinating, very complicated relationships here. Now, when you have this kind of a posematic or warning coloration, you can see examples where other species also benefit. So not just the relatives of the ones that get eaten, not just the species that has the coloration, but other species can also benefit from this coloration. And we have a, a cool phenomenon called mimicry. And so sometimes you can have non-dangerous species that mimic the dangerous species and look like those dangerous species. So, you know, when the predator learns to avoid this dangerous species, it also learns to avoid all these other species. Now, those other species are actually not dangerous, but they all look like the dangerous species. And so that's called mimicry. And specifically, that's called Batesian mimicry. And in Batesian mimicry, the model is inedible. So the model has that warning coloration and produces something that makes the predator sick or die or whatever. The mimic is edible. The mimic is a species that can be eaten and the predator, you know, won't harm the predator. But the mimic's way of defending itself is to look like the dangerous species. That's cool. That's Batesian mimicry. And so here, for example, uh, the top picture is that coral snake that is very dangerous. The bottom picture is a scarlet king snake that is not dangerous. But that scarlet king snake sure looks a lot like that coral snake, right? And there's a, there's a, a rhyme, a mnemonic device that you can use to keep, to, to tell yourself the difference between the coral snake and the scarlet king snake, and I can never remember it, and I wouldn't touch either one of these things. But the point is, is that the scarlet king snake is not dangerous, and if a predator attacked it, that predator would be fine. But the predator doesn't know that. The predator looks at that and thinks, ooh, that's one of those coral snakes and I'm not going to mess with it. Batesian mimicry. Um, and so within this relationship, you have other relationships you can talk about, right? And so if you've got a mimic, you know, here's an edible, non-dangerous species but it's mimicking a dangerous species. Well, how does the fitness of the mimic affect it? Well, the mimic's fitness goes up, right? Because the mimic looks like it's dangerous, so it's less likely to get preyed upon. That's good for the mimic. Mimic fitness goes up. So the predators, when they learn to avoid that model, they learn to avoid you know, they know to avoid that dangerous species. Well, they're also going to avoid that mimic, even though that mimic happens to be dangerous. The predator doesn't know that. So the, model, the mimic's fitness goes up. Well, what about the fitness of the model, the dangerous species? How is their fitness affected? Well, their fitness might actually go down, right? So what if this predator is learning, you know, again, in my blue jay example, the blue jay had to learn which species to avoid. Well, what happens if that blue jay happened to, you know, or, or the predator happens to sample the mimic first? It's going to grab this thing that's brightly colored. It's going to eat it. It's going to taste good. It's going to go, oh, anything that looks like this, I'm going to attack. And so then it attacks another species that looks like that, but it happens to be the model. It happens to be the dangerous species. Well, now the predator is sick and has trouble, but, but in the meantime, that model species got eaten or attacked, and so the model species went down. And so you've got a situation here where the mimic fitness kind of goes up and the model fitness can kind of go down because of that relationship. And so one benefits and one, one loses. That's a, a, an example of 
it's not really predator prey relationship but it's a parasitic relationship which we'll talk about here in a second and so you know the the dangerous species the model benefits from being brightly colored because it'll get protection from the predator but as long as that mimics around it actually doesn't get as much protection as it should and so the the model is you know selected to their 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 patterns are always their colors always changing and the mimic is always changing to stay it's a fascinating complicated relationship and so if the predator eats a mimic first the predator will think the model is okay so the model fitness goes down and so when you look at the mimic model relationship one benefits one loses but that's not a predator prey relationship it's actually a parasitic relationship anyway this is why I think this is cool now we also have something called Mullerian mimicry and Mullerian mimicry both the model and the mimic are inedible so you've got different species they're all inedible but they all look alike well there's an advantage to the prey there because the predator doesn't have to learn as much right if you've got a couple of species and they're all inedible but the predator has to learn that they're all inedible and has to learn all these different color patterns to avoid but the, in that case selection is going to select for those prey to all look the same because they're all inedible but they all look the same so the predator has to learn hey anything that looks like this I'm just going to avoid it and so that's a different type of mimicry and so both the model and the mimic benefit from Eularian mimicry their fitness of both prey species goes up because the predator isn't as confused and in that case when the both the fitness of both goes up that's actually mutualism which we'll talk about here in a second so again it's just cool stuff and so here we've got a couple of butterflies and I don't even remember which butterflies these are right but I think the top is like a monarch and the bottom is a maybe a viceroy or a queen I can't remember you've got several species and when you really start to study this mimicry it becomes even more complicated than this and and again but it's more fascinating so it's not as simplistic as what I'm telling you but it is kind of that simple anyway in this example I think you've got you know the monarch which we know is toxic and you also have the I want to say it's the viceroy and the viceroy is also toxic but they look very much like each other right and so that blue jay that ate a monarch earlier is going to look at any of these things and say oh, I'm not touching them ever again and that's good because they're all toxic but they benefit these butterflies benefit because that predator doesn't have to learn too many patterns here's another example of Mullerian mimicry right all these things that are all dangerous and they all have these black and yellow bands on them and you know you know if you saw this hornet or something like that with that coloration you would know to leave it alone they all have that same uh, either they sting or they have uh, some kind of defense and so they all look each like each other so the predator only has to learn that one pattern now some other cool examples of defenses that prey have evolved for example what I call old-school defenses uh, guess, you know in, in more uh, ancient organisms that used to live you saw a lot more armor and you still see some organisms today that use simple armor to defend themselves but you saw it a lot more I think in earlier organisms and then organisms over time evolved uh, to be um, faster and to move around and that was better for them than having this big bulky armor but you still see some right turtles have big bulky armor and that works well for them armadillos uh, the bottom fish is a sturgeon got big plates certainly in fish fish used to have you know a few hundred million years ago they had big heavy external armor to protect themselves and over time fish evolved to be faster and more uh, flexible and, and, and can move around easier and so then the armor was not as important and but still you see that some organisms that's their protection just have a, a, a shell that you can go into and protect yourself from that predator um, another example that 
of things that prey do to protect themselves from predators, something like predator confusion. So here we see a school of fish. And lots of fish school up. Well, why? Well, there's lots of reasons. There's sort of the many eye theory that all these fish in a school, you've got lots of, you know, if they're, if they're together, they're all looking out. And so you've got lots of eyes watching for a predator. So for an individual fish, there's an advantage to being in a school because you've got extra vigilance because everybody's watching out for the predator. So that could be one reason. There could be, you know, foraging reasons. There could be lots of reasons working simultaneously. One explanation, though, is, is that by being in a school, you confuse the predator. So if a predator comes and tries to attack a fish in this school, you know, these fish are all moving around. It's very difficult to pick out an individual fish and eat it. And so the predator tries to attract, attack the school, but has difficulty actually catching a fish because of the confusion sown by swimming around. So that could be a reason why fish school up. And like I said, there could be lots of reasons. Now, we used to think, we used to say that, that that's why zebras have stripes, is that it's confusing to the predator. And so these zebras that are running in a herd and they're all striped and it makes it difficult for the predator to pick out an individual zebra and eat it. And so that's why they have this very interesting coloration. But I think more recent studies have suggested that that's not why zebras have these stripes. And this is a great example of the scientific method where we have these hypotheses about these phenomena and then you have competing hypotheses and you collect data and you throw out the ones that are unsupported. And so there's not a lot of good support for the predator confusion hypothesis for these stripes. But more recent evidence suggests that the, the zebra stripes help protect them from flies. And so there's so several studies that have suggested that fewer insects like horse flies land on striped patterns. And so the stripes of the zebra keep it from being uh, attacked by flies, which carry a lot of disease. And it might have something to do with polarized light. And so there's experimental evidence that shows that um, the location and the size of the stripes influences how many insects attack a particular organism. And you see this cool study here where they took horses and they draped them with uh, covers that made them look like zebras and videoed the interactions of these horses with flies and so you know you have the same horse that you you watch it when it doesn't have the cover when it does have the cover and you can see a significant reduction in the number of flies that land on it when it does have the striped color cover so there's something about uh, those stripes that might make it confusing for an insect, and the in fewer insects land, and so you get fewer diseases. Pretty cool, right? Now, having said that, I promise you that you're, somebody is going to try and capitalize on this, and they're going to start selling, you know, striped, zebra-striped outfits to wear when you're camping, so insects don't land on you more. Well, it's not that simple, you know, we're talking about horse size, but, you know, hey, whatever, more power to you. The fascinating thing here is that that might be a good explanation of why they have this very unique coloration and it's got nothing to do with, with predation. And again, this is the scientific method in practice. Okay, um, another interesting result of predator-prey interactions is something called predator satiation. So some prey have evolved to emerge or show up all at once. And so the predator just becomes overwhelmed. The predator cannot possibly eat them all, and so there's you know strength in numbers. And so some prey just overwhelm the predator, and that ensures that at least there will be some organisms that survive, and that's a, a strategy, another strategy that evolved. And so cicadas are a good example, right? When cicadas hatch, and so Here's a graph showing uh, the cicada hatch over time related to the percent mortality of cicadas over time. And so, you know, the cicadas, when they emerge, and, and they all emerge over a short period of time, they're super loud and, 
And uh, you see that in this study, you get a huge number of cicadas emerging. And the predators take time to recognize that they're prey, or the predators simply aren't ready. They're not used to this many prey. And so then over time, the predators, you can see that the percent mortality goes up. The predators are getting better and better at catching these cicadas. And they're learning that the cicadas are a good prey source. Right? But by the time the predators catch on, the cicadas have already emerged, mated, laid eggs, and so they sort of overwhelmed the predator. And this might explain why you have lots of cicada species that emerge like every 13 years or every nine, uh, 17 years. Often the cicadas emerge in prime number years. And that's interesting, and that's probably because it makes it very difficult for predators to synchronize with this cicada hatch and to synchronize the life cycles because the cicadas emerge at prime number of years. That's kind of just another fascinating fact. Okay, so that was a lot about predation, predator-prey relationships, but we still have other interspecific relationships we can talk about. And remember, in predation, the fitness of the predator went up, and the fitness of the prey went down. Well, in parasitism, we have the same thing. The fitness of one species goes up, and the fitness of another species goes down. But the one species does not kill the other species. So the parasite fitness goes up, and the host fitness goes down. But the parasite often doesn't kill the host because the parasite needs those hosts for its life cycle and so it it would be a disadvantage to actually kill the host and so that's what differentiates parasitism from predation and so again the parasite derives nourishment from another organism and the host is harmed in the process so it's like predator prey in that one benefits and the other is hurt but it's unlike predator prey in that the, the one that's hurt doesn't usually get killed. Now, parasitism is probably the most popular lifestyle on Earth. Uh, there's, there's just a tremendous number of species that, that behave as parasite. And parasites are really cool because they often have a complex life cycle that involves several different species. So it's not just the parasite doesn't have just one host, it has several different hosts and they have these complex life cycles. So for example, here's a, a flatworm called the yellow grub, which is a common aquatic uh, parasite. And it grows, one, one part of its life cycle occurs in a fish, and then the fish gets eaten by a, a bird, and then the parasite develops in that bird, and then the, um, the, the, when the bird poops, the parasite eggs, the yellow grub eggs are released into the water, and then when they hatch, um, they swim into a snail, and then the parasite develops. Another part of the life cycle occurs in the snail, and then the parasite leaves the snail and goes and infects a fish, and that can, you know, completes this very complicated life cycle. Um, and what's really cool is that sometimes these parasites manipulate the host to help themselves. So the parasite can change the host behavior in such a way that benefits the parasite. And so for example, there's a trematode um, parasite. Again, you know, you saw in that previous example that snails hosted one part of that life cycle. Well, this is a different uh, uh, a parasite, but it also goes in snails. And when the snail is infected with this trematode parasite, it causes the snail tentacles to grow larger and to pulsate and to, to be much more obvious. And so snails that are infected with the parasite, are, they're called lighthouse snails because their antennae show up a lot better. And the end result of that is those snails that have those antennae that pulsate are much more 
easily seen by birds and they're much more likely to be eaten by birds but the bird is the next step in the life cycle of that trematode parasite and so that parasite is actually making the snail more likely to be eaten by a bird because it benefits the parasite that's cool that is really cool and so you know here's an example of one of those snails and it's got these enlarged obvious antennae that make it more likely to be eaten by a bird which is the next organism in the parasites life cycle and so it does greatly reduce the fitness of the snail but the parasite definitely benefits because it gets to go in into the bird that's cool another example of this you know rats are naturally afraid of cats and will avoid them but when rats get infected by a protozoan called toxoplasma gondii toxoplasma toxoplasmosis is the disease when the rats are infected by that protozoan they're no longer afraid of cats they're actually kind of attracted to cats or the smell of cat urine and so the rats do not avoid cats and so that means the rat is more likely to be eaten by the cat well the cat is the next organism in that toxoplasmos toxoplasma life cycle and so again you've got the parasite is changing the behavior of one of its hosts to make it more likely that that host is going to be eaten by a different host in the parasites life cycle that's cool but the fact that the, the this protozoan parasite affects the behavior of one of its hosts to benefit it that's fantastic and and by studying this you see that it seems to affect dopamine levels in the rat brain so it's actually changing the brain chemistry of the rat and that's how it changes its behavior and there's some evidence that seems to be linked links between this parasite in humans and schizophrenia right and so you've got this parasite in a human that's messing with dopamine levels and brain chemistry that's causing diseases and changes of behavior in the human just like it does in the rat that's fascinating and it starts to make you think about all those other organisms that live in your gut and they're all releasing chemicals and so it starts to make you question you know am I who I think I am you know uh, uh, you know the, the thing I think therefore I am but but do I really control the neurons in my brain or is it the parasites living in my gut releasing chemicals that make me think I'm controlling my brain but they're actually controlling my brain and my behavior that's really cool and I wouldn't bring it up if we didn't have lots of examples of this occurring in nature very interesting okay um, so earlier I mentioned mutualism mutualism um, is something you might be familiar with it's an example where you have interspecific relationships where both species benefit the fitness of both goes up because of the relationship and you see lots of this too and this is fascinating and so you know you've got lots of of organisms that live in your gut that aren't parasites but they're actually mutualists they help you digest and you provide them with food and again both species in the mutualistic relationship benefit their fitness goes up good examples an acacia tree and the ants that live on there and so the acacia tree has these thorns that are hollow gives the ants a place to live and the acacia tree has these glands that release nectar and so the ants get something to eat but the acacia tree benefits because the ants attack herbivores that try to feed off the acacia tree and so it's a mutualistic ben uh, a relationship they both benefit something else that's kind of cool something else that the ants do for the acacia tree is um, they might help to reduce bacterial infections and so wherever you have the the ants you also have less bacteria which benefits that acacia tree and this micro microbial protection that the ants give to the tree probably comes 
from other bacteria that are mutualists that live inside the gut of the ant. So you've got even more species. So you've got bacteria in the ant gut that give the ant protection against bacterial species, but subsequently also help to protect the acacia tree, which is giving the ants a place to live and nectar. Everybody wins because they're all cooperating. Humans could learn from this. Okay, and so now the last interspecific interaction that I want to talk about is something called commensalism. And this is not as common as these others, but it's still interesting. And so if you remember in competition, both species lost. It was lose-lose. Their fitness went down of both. In predation, one species benefited, one species was hurt. The predator, you know, killed the prey. And so the predator's fitness went up, the prey's fitness went down. In parasitism, the fitness of the parasite goes up, the fitness of the host goes down, but the host doesn't die, so it's different. In mutualism, the fitness of both species goes up, so it's win-win. In commensalism, it's win-neutral. One species benefits, the other species does not seem to be affected. Um, so the fitness of, of one species goes up, the fitness of the other is, is neither hurt nor harmed. That would be commensalism. It's not as common, but still interesting. And so one species benefits, and the either is neither harmed nor helped. A classic example is the cattle egret. So the cattle egrets, those white birds, they ride around on the backs of the, of the cattle. The egrets benefit greatly from this relationship because the cattle stir up insects which the egret eats. So by hanging out with cattle, you get more insects stirred up, you get a better meal. Egret benefits. Does this affect the cow in any way? No, the, ca the cattle, are, are, their fitness is, is not really changed. You know, whether the birds are there or not there doesn't seem to affect the cattle. That would be a, a good example of commensalism. Okay, so here's a table from your book, kind of again going over these different types of relationships and giving you examples of each of them. And so, you know, just for something for you to think about, um, a quick quiz. Think about a, a, a bird nesting in a tree. So you've got a bird, which is one species, you've got a tree, which is a different species, right? This is an interspecific relationship. How would you describe it? Would you say this is competition, predation, parasitism, mutualism, or commensalism, and why? Well, I'm going to let you think about that, and um, I'm going to leave you with that. So like I said, um, kind of the point of this lecture was to introduce you to these very interesting, complicated relationships. We're talking about community ecology, where we've got several different species interacting. Uh, we could spend a whole semester class just talking about these things, and we do in our ecology classes. Um, this is what I really think is interesting. I think a lot of people... Uh, get into this sort of thing. I wish we had more time to talk about it, but you know, we're just trying to, to introduce you to these different concepts. Anyway, that's really all I have for this lecture. So I'll see you later. Let me know if you got any questions.